Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, my name, again, is Ann Hickey. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Operations with the City of Chicago's Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Yes, it is a mouthful. I use she, her, her pronouns. I am a Caucasian woman with shoulder-length blonde curly hair, and I am wearing a hot pink suit coat. <laughs> and I am here to talk to you a little bit tonight about my 24 years of experience with the city of Chicago in navigating the tangled web of city agencies and how that is used to produce large-scale events in the city of Chicago. So I'm going to start by telling you just a little bit about myself, and I'm happy to also answer more questions in the Q&A. Um, I actually, as I mentioned, I've been with the city for 24 years, but before that I actually started as an intern um, and then came back to work full time. Um, what's listed here are my current responsibilities, but I've done pretty much everything from programming to public relations and marketing um, to working on farmers markets, Maxwell Street Market, and then I currently oversee uh, the permitting team, the event operation operations team and the facility operations. So the permits team, we um, accept and process the special event and athletic permits. The event operations team, we oversee all of the operations for the DKs festivals and events. We also oversee the city coordination for the 32 parades that take place and are on site for 19 of them, and the Chicago Air and Water Show, Memorial Day commemoration activities, and Veterans Day. And then for facility operations, we support the implementation of project and events in Millennium Park and also the beautiful Chicago Cultural Center. On here, you can host your wedding there if you're looking for a space. And if you've never been there, it is an absolutely outstandingly beautiful space that is free to enter. It's called the People's Palace for a reason and other DK's facilities. So um, Katie and Derek can tell you that um, I was very honored that they actually called and asked me to be part of this, but I called them about a week or two ago and I said, why did you ask me to be here? When I was looking through and you know, kind of researching a lot of the different presentations that has happened, I said, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not a data person. You know, like we actually don't use, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of data with our office. And Katie said, well, that's kind of why we wanted you here. Like we want you here to offer a different perspective on what you do. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do is, you know, through the 24 years of what I've done, um, I've been kind of known to be the person that gets it done. My city phone probably has um, contact information to call anyone at any city department to be able to get something done in the city of Chicago for an event or something else. And that's something that has taken me 24 years to develop. Um, and it's not something that I take lightly. And it's something that I'm very proud of. So for today, what I'm hoping to do is give you a little bit of a taste of what that is and give you some information and utilize that second 25 minutes to answer your questions. And so I'm hoping to give you that content and then talk to you and have a great conversation. So I'm going to start with a general overview of events in the city of Chicago, just kind of a summary of types, and then provide kind of a cheat sheet of city agencies um, do a case study. So I actually um, am responsible for the Chicago Air and Water Show. It's also a really cool event and something that I find everybody is familiar with. So I thought it would be an easy example for people to kind of relate to. And it also really takes every city agency to help put this on. And I'm also I'm going to end. I was very fortunate. Um, I'm close with uh, a colleague at um, our office, OEMC, and he allowed me to um, share a couple of our safety tabletop examples that can just show you some of the preparation that our city public safety agencies do in order to plan um, for the many events that happen throughout the city of Chicago. And then excited to have a Q and A with you. So events in the city of Chicago, there are thousands of events in, this, in Chicago annually with millions of attendees that play, take place all throughout the city. And these are Lollapalooza, NASCAR, which if any of you drove down here, you're still experiencing the traffic. Hopefully you were able to either attend it or see it um, on TV. I think it showcased our city really well. 
Air and Water Show, Taste of Chicago. Those are events that my office produces. Then we have some of the neighborhood festivals like Taste of Randolph, Bucktown Arts Fest, um, the Chicago Park District events, Pride in the Park, Chosen Few Picnic. We've got parades, block parties, pub crawls, activations, and more recently, unplanned protests and processions that are popping up more and more often that we deal with. There are also organizers of all different levels of expertise. NASCAR this past weekend showed you a high level of expertise producing a phenomenal event, even with extreme weather, on how they handled it. There are C3, who does Lollapalooza, and then there are local organizations like Chicago Special Events Management, Ravenswood Special Events, and Star Events. They are more than likely responsible for a lot of the community events that take place throughout the neighborhoods. One of the things that we've also discovered at DCASE is post-COVID, there are a lot of new organizers looking to produce events in their neighborhoods, and we are excited about it. A lot of these neighborhoods need to stimulate their community. They want to bring people back, and they also want to get, you know, get money for businesses, money for musicians. It's a lot of hand-holding on our part to get them through the permit process, but we are excited to work with them to do that because of what it brings to their communities. Now, what we get to do at DCASE, um, one of the things we get to do is to help them through the special event permit application. Um, and I do have a website. I'm not going to go into it now. But um, any event, an outdoor event or an athletic event, so marathon, um, you know, any of, uh, any of the 5K runs and walks that go through, anything like that held in the city of Chicago must actually do a special event permit through our office if they check any of these boxes. If they close a city street, if they prepare food on a public street, if they sell or serve alcohol, if they sell merchandise, if they have a tent larger than 20 feet, if they have a stage taller than, 20, than 2 feet. Bar crawls also must complete an application if the event exceeds 500 participants, includes five or more stops, or three or more stops on like the same street or block. So all of those come through our office. Right now, we already have 700 that we've been processing this summer, just to give you an idea. And organizations must do this at least 21 days in advance. While it sounds like it might be a lot, it's a lot to do in 21 days to get something done. Here's kind of a little cheat sheet that I put together. This definitely does not list all of our city departments. I think one of the things that um, people who are new to the city of Chicago or, or who are trying to do anything with the city of Chicago, quite frankly, even if it's to pay a parking ticket or a water bill, are amazed at the number of acronyms that the city that exist in the city of Chicago. CPD, CFD, OEMC, D case, you know, BACP. You're like, where the heck am I going to do something? So this is, I am actually going to go through these when I do my case study, but this actually I'm going to post in my office because it actually is a really great way to identify, and I may give it to new people who actually start with our office, to explain to them the acronyms um, for the different city departments. I thought it would be um, an easy way to explain, first of all, what all those acronyms and city departments do and how they help to support an event by going through a case study for the upcoming Chicago Air and Water Show. So now all of you can say, when the Chicago Air and Water Show happens the 9th and 10th of August, I know what happens here. I'm going to start with the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, my office. We work to produce the event free to the public, and I'm going to stress free to the public. We are very fortunate that this mayor and the mayors before him continue to uh, recognize the importance of providing events free to the city of Chicago and tourists and patrons who come. It is not... It is very irregular to have a city municipality actually producing these events. Most places around the nation, private, uh, or private organizers are doing this, and they are charging money to do so. You guys can still come to the Air and Water Show and Taste of Chicago and other events for free admission. Air and Water Show is a little bit unique. I am not a pilot. I do not know, nor would I ever want to, be able to have the Blue Angels fly through the city of Chicago and be responsible for that. We consult with and hire an air show team who are experts. The majority of them are pilots and previous military experience. They are the ones who recruit for us both the military and um, civilian performers, and then are responsible with working with the FAA, O'Hare, Midway, getting us airspace, and then actually doing and executing the air show itself. Because I can't do that. 
I am responsible for securing and managing a budget, which is incredibly important with the city of Chicago because I don't get extra money. We're also responsible for setting up and maintaining the event site. So the Chicago Air and Water Show, primarily the main area is at North Avenue Beach, but it extends from there. But our office is responsible for, you know, the maintenance and the um, security, the private security and hospitality and other elements that take place there. And then we coordinate with city agencies, which I'll go into in a minute, and request support. I am going to start by acknowledging the importance of working with your aldermen, because the alderman is someone who is able to get out information to their constituents. They are also, and I will acknowledge this, the first one that a resident of the city of Chicago will complain to when they don't like something. So it is incredibly important to make sure that they're aware of everything going on and you can actually really work with them to your advantage because they're able to get information out that I can't get to. So we really um, value their partnership and support. And with something like the Air and Water Show, while it takes place in the 43rd Ward, it stretches multiple wards. So we work with multiple aldermen and alder persons in order to do that. So this is just to give you an overview of um, some of the highlights of kind of our on-site operations um, at North Avenue Beach. And I'm not sure it's um, exactly how well you can see it. For those of you that haven't been there, this is North Avenue Beach, and the boathouse is Castaways. Now, in the parking lot, this area right over in here is actually a series of trailers. So we have our DK's operations trailers, and you can't see it exactly too well, but there is a CPD, a CFD, and an OEMC trailer there. These are command centers. Inside, they are completely outfitted with cameras going to a variety of different locations so that they have access to be able to look throughout the city of Chicago and different areas to be able to support the event. What's beneficial for that is that this command center is right here with us, so it has a main point of contact so that we can work with them and help us address any issue that comes either with the event or be able to navigate if something else is coming in that we need to be made aware of. So it's, in, it's very important to have that there. And then it has you know, all the, the you know, police vehicles, things like that, so that we can have them on site as well. It's kind of the hub and the base for that to happen. And then the other thing is our platform. So the platform actually um, has um, the, the people who are running the air show and also, um, also watching on the water as well. So you've got people on the air show team actually watching out for uh, and actually planning um, the planes as they go by, working with the FAA. You've got OEMC. You've got the National Weather Service um, watching any type of weather coming through. Um, the Chicago Fire Department and the um, United States Coast Guard as well. Now, the Office of Emergency Communications, starting to get into my acronyms here and explaining them for you, OEMC, they are responsible. They kind of keep us all together. They're pre-planning meetings and coordination. They also are the ones that have the TMA or TCAs. So every time, you know, when you go to any event and you see people on the street that are crossing you and making sure that vehicles don't hit you in the crowd, that's a TMA. Thank them. OEMC is also responsible for communicating out any safety and important information. And I'm saying this because all of you, if you have not done so, I would highly recommend downloading the OEMC app. And if nothing else, sign up for Smart 911. We have this small event called the DNC coming to Chicago at the end of August. OEMC will push out safety information continuously to let you know what's happening. It is a very valuable resource to have. The Chicago Police Department couldn't do anything without them. They actually provide support both on land and on water, and they provide a heck of a lot of support. There are a lot of people in blue out there at the, at the base and then also all the way along the beach with crowd management and also addressing any issues that might come up um, at street crossings. And then what we call at the end of the event, we call it a dump. That's when a hund hundreds of thousands of people are leaving an event at the same time. <laughs> Chicago police help make sure all those people leave safely. I mean, it's a lot. <laughs> and they also have a marine boat that's out there as well. The Chicago Fire Department. 
So because it's a city event, they actually provide the EMS and ambulance. So we have ambulances both at North Avenue Beach, and they are staged along the um, at, you know strategic locations. Um, they because it's so crowded, they have bike teams, they have ATVs. Um, it's actually pretty amazing. They develop the plans. So if you are at Fullerton Avenue on the beach and pass out from the heat, and somebody calls 911, that is transferred to the base at North Avenue Beach, and someone on site is sent out to retrieve you, brought back, brought to an ambulance on site, and followed a specific route to the closest hospital that has been pre-planned. So you guys might not realize that, but that is something that has been in a plan that CPD has coordinated in advance. We take it for granted, they practice it, they execute it, and that's how they keep us all safe. They also have boats in the water and they have um, a helicopter as well. And the helicopter goes and they can see obviously from the air if there's any issues that are developing in the water. Um, you know, a lot of, um, at the air and water show, um, if you guys have been there, you've noticed that there is a space that nobody, you, no boat vessels are allowed to be in a specific area where the planes go across. That is a safety zone. And that is because if for any reason something happens where um, something, you know, a plane, if there's a plane hits or something falls off of a plane, they have to, per FAA requirements, be able to fall within a safety zone. So between the Chicago Coast, the United States Coast Guard, CFD and CPD, those boats, they are keeping vessels outside of that. There are also, I mean, I find at the Chicago Air and Water Show, there are just as many boats as there are people. And people on boats fall in the water. And CPD and CFD will be there to help retrieve them if needed. The Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, MOPD. Now, this is actually a department that, and an initiative that's become near and dear to my heart. I'm actually the access officer for our department as well. Um, we have a commissioner, Commissioner Rachel Arfa, who was here since the previous administration. And she has really instilled in myself, and she continues to instill in other organizers, the importance of making sure that accessibility is found in every single event. And not just that it's accessible, but that the experience that someone who requires an accessible or has a need has the same experience as someone else who is coming there, that there is not, they're not treated any differently. Um, and it's an education process that I continue to learn. We also, one of the things she had us start, which is actually pretty fascinating, is audio description. So if you have any visual impairments, there's actually, you can listen on the radio anywhere along the beach and you can hear someone describing the experience of the planes going by. So in addition to Herb Hunter, who's actually the announcer, this person is describing what the plane looks like, what they're doing, all that type of stuff in addition to it. It's actually pretty fascinating. And then we also provide access to the beach. Um, we do put some flooring down so that if you are in a wheelchair or mobility, you can actually get access to the beach in different ways as well. On-site support, so streets and sanitation, SNS. We have snow fence, barricades and cones, posting of no parking and tow truck. You're not so favorite people when they tow your car. They are very important. I mean, they're basically helping us make sure that the event space is ready um, for us to come into. And then they also provide the street sweeper at the end to make sure that it's clean. The Department of Water, DOW, um, they provide the center point boat. That is literally the center point of the air and water show from which the entire um, air show is called from, or uh, where, the, where they call it from. Um, Fleet and Facilities Management, 2FM, they work with us to provide the sound, which ties in so that people can hear it all along the beach, and they provide generators, power, and phones. So, for, it, you know, we actually have, we have to have a landline because, God forbid, we actually lose um, the ability to talk to someone when they're in the air. Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, BACP, um, they help us, um, first of all, making sure that merchants who are there um, are there legally and safely, and then also the illegal merchants kind of shooing them out of the way. They also make sure that liquor licenses, um, that if they're taking place, are there. And one that somehow fell off my list is um, Department of Buildings, DOB. Um, they are, um, they're not necessarily... Actually, let me make sure they're not over here. I didn't put them on here for some reason. Um, they, um, 
they, if there's a stage over two feet, they're making sure that there is um, a permit for it. They also, and actually I noticed this when I was out, um, I went into NASCAR for a little bit, um, any type of uh, like structure um, they have to permit. And I noticed it when a sign fell over at NASCAR. You know, they have to make sure that those are permitted. Um, there are also a lot of watch parties in the buildings. So Department of Buildings is on call in case there are any issues in a facility, in a building, if it's structure, if there's any, you know, any porches that fall, anything like that, they are on call to make sure those issues are addressed. Additional city support, so the Chicago Department of Aviation helps with the Gary Jet Center. Um, they help to make sure the equipment is clear on the runway. The Chicago Department of Transportation, CDOT, they do street closure permits and they also um, coordinate if there's construction um, and rerouting. We want to make sure that come down to the um, North Avenue Beach that there's not actually a construction project taking place there. The Chicago Transit Authority, CTA, uh, they work to reroute buses, but then also provide additional buses. At the end of the event, um, when people are leaving, there's that huge crowd. We want to make sure that they actually get out of there as quickly as possible. And then they provide cooling buses as well. Partner agencies are the Chicago Park District. They um, provide lifeguards, buoy markers um, that mark off the area where people can't go in, concessions and beach landscaping. And then the United States Coast Guard, who works to keep the area clear and then also does demonstrations. That was a lot of information very quickly, I know. Um, but I just kind of wanted to provide to show you a little bit about what city agencies do to support an event. What I wanted to also end with is talking about some safety tabletop examples that I had kind of mentioned in the beginning. Um, these are kind of real life examples, what people do at OEMC. Um, we, the city agencies go through these scenarios before an event to kind of test how they would react if something were to happen. So the first one, a Memorial Day protest. This is based on something that happened um, or, or could have happened with Memorial Day last year. So Memorial Day protest against war. Several anti-war groups and organizations aligned against the various conflicts around the world are organizing a, a parallel rally in March on Sunday, May 26th. This is in last year, whose line of march is Roosevelt Road from Canal to Columbus. Current intelligence has the march rally attracting upwards of 5,000 people. The aim of the organizers is to highlight the loss of life of civilians in these various conflicts and to advocate for the global ceasefire. The organizers intend to start their march at around 1,400 hours. Several veterans groups are organizing counter-protesters for this event as they see it as disrespectful of the organizers to hold this event on Memorial Day weekend. So if this is shown visually, this is Roosevelt Road. They show where the march um, starts and ends. To throw a little loop on it, on Memorial Day, or on Sunday, reports have also been made, there's several social media posts advertising a teen trend at Roosevelt Collection and Target on Roosevelt Road between Delano Court and Clark Street. The social media posts have a start time at 3 p.m. So now you have not only two different potential groups, but a third teen trend in the center of it, so you actually have three different groups potentially coming all together. So these are some considerations that the, organi that the city agencies would go and consider. Public safety personnel deployment for protest and teen trend. Roosevelt collection and, tar and target security coordination. Critical messaging, traffic control, severe traffic impacts, ingress and egress for public safety personnel, surface transit reroutes, so buses, car, and traffic, possible impact to Sueños, which is an event happening that weekend, and concurrent events that day. So in this particular thing, what would happen is CPD and CFD would go through their responses to how they would actually handle this. And in a situation, thankfully, most of the time when there's protest, um, they are given advance, um, uh, advance notice that something might happen and given time to mobilize. A second one is a severe weather pop-up thunderstorm on a parade route. So an hour before the start of a parade, the National Weather Service issues a severe thunderstorm warning for a pop-up storm that has developed just south of the route. The storm will be over the route and the parade from 11.30 to 11.50 hours. Wind gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour are expected, as well as scattering lightning and one to two inches of rain. So some of the considerations, delaying the start of the parade, communication to people along the route, 
weather shelter locations, public safety personnel redeployment, flooding concerns, securing any structures or floats susceptible to high winds, continued weather monitoring, additional CTA resources to take people away from the parade route. And one of the things that's really important here is having the city public safety's um, uh, departments work with the organizers to make sure that they are um, you know, working with all of the people actually watching the event to, um, to, deal, to make sure that they're all safe and adjust. Okay, that was a lot. So. <laughs> Um, minor question about the 50 examples at the end. Um, what is a teen trend? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, there are groups that post social media about meetups. So it's you telling your friend, like starting a... God, I'm, I'm not good at this because I'm not a teen. Um, it's basically posting something like, hey, let's meet up and cause a problem here. Or let's meet up and do this here type of thing. Um, so it's a post on social media, and then it gets likes and follows, essentially. Um, so it's, yeah. Does that make sense? It's like a flash mob? Is that yes. a little yeah. outdated term? Yes, <laughs> it is a little bit of an outdated term, yes. I'm also not a teen. Yes. <laughs> What an interesting job is what I was thinking through all of that. I'm curious, uh, what have you learned over the years about hosting complex events across the city? What are some of the things that you probably could only learn through doing them? Oh, God. Um, so, first of all, an event never goes as planned. And anyone who says that an event is perfect, it never is. There is always something that goes wrong, and it is how you adapt to that um, that makes it actually, you know, makes it go okay. Most, for the most part, nobody ever knows that something went wrong, only you. Um, what makes you a good event planner is how you actually adapt to the changes and solve the problems. So I consider myself a good event planner because over the years I've learned to solve lots and lots and lots of problems. Um, and also... Um, learning and knowing who else to call to solve those problems. I've kind of gotten to a point where I hope, and now that I say that, I should knock on something, that you know, no problem is unsolvable if you know who to have help you resolve that. So those are the main things. <laughs> but, but it is also, um, I mean, I can probably do things a lot easier working for the city. It is, inc it is a lot more difficult for people trying to do events. Um, you know, I think I mentioned, like, especially like new organizers, it's very overwhelming to come and see all of this and be like, oh my goodness, you know, what do I do? Um, but I think our office does a really good job of helping people through it. We do a lot of webinars. We do a lot of things that we have on the website that people can look at as well to help them navigate through it to figure out how to do it because we recognize it's a lot of steps. You know, it's like, okay, so I signed up to do, I did an event, but oh, wait, I have a merchant and I have to go to BACP. And oh, wait, but I have a building permit and that has to be a different permit that goes through Department of Buildings. You know, so there's, there's a lot of different elements to it that we recognize are very difficult to do. So I just want to say first things, like the Blues Fest is literally my favorite event ever uh, from New Orleans, and so it makes me feel very, like, at home. So just thank you for that. Um, my question, um, in my role at UChicago, um, I help kind of um, track permitting. Um, and so what I noticed on the city data portal is that the permit data for the Department of Transit is available for export. Um, but the DK's permits are not. And I'm curious if, um, if you can speak to that and um, if that was something that you guys are planning or something that you've decided against for you know, very good reason. Because um, that would be helpful for us because a lot of times people will have an event and people will think that it's us doing it. Um, and if we could know within our geographic zone like what's happening, then that can help Sarah a lot, you know, when people call and then we're like, we don't know what's, you know, ah. anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there and see if that's something that you guys had considered. Um, we currently don't have software to actually track it, um, and it would be excellent to do that. 
Um, we, Julie's nodding at me. She used to work. The, it's, um, I mean, we utilize Excel. And I mean, like we, we have a lot that we could move forward on. And it's interesting because who did you say actually offers the information? The Department of Transportation. Has, yeah, has their permit. So basically, like, I built a dashboard for someone in our office. So, like, once a week, I'll export all the current form permits, the transit permits in zone, uh, sorry, Ward 5. And then she'll get an email that says, like, the following people have um, filed permits, but it's not us. And then the following people have filed permits without the help of our office, but, like, up as a part of our institution to kind of... You know, in case she gets a call, she doesn't have to guess, like, is this us or someone else? Um, anyway, but I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, it would actually, I, that's part of the reason why I was excited to come here, honestly, is because I would love to learn about how we can do that. I mean, like, for example, right now, you know, in notifying aldermen, we download an Excel spreadsheet and send them the list of their events, and they want to know what they are. So having, uh, you know, a software mechanism to kind of put it in a way that's user-friendly isn't something that we're not doing on purpose. It's because we don't currently have a mechanism in place to do it. So anyone who has ideas, please let me know. <laughs> So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah staying on topic about uh, permits. Mm -hmm. Like, so when, suppose I want to submit a special permit application, and if I want to define boundaries of the event that I'm hosting, how do I define the boundaries? Would it be like 60 feet east of South Canal Street, or is it like a web UI where I can like define, like pull the boundaries? Or are there features that you would want to implement within the permit application? And I have a follow up. Yeah, um, it's by street address is currently how it's done. And it can be tricky because then you get to parks, for example, and it's like, well, you know, that's technically an address. Um, it's so it, it can, you know, it could probably be improved on as well. But yeah, currently it is like a, you know, a start and an end for um, the location. Uh, and the follow up was about like word culture. So like given at any given time, like you probably have like 10 minutes on your plate to schedule, right? So. I wish <laughs> uh, but so how do you like uh, like as an organization like manage those events or like schedule those events like because I work with DWM, DWM and like they only work with email like and what is your process do you have any tools that you use or do you have any like specific process that you implement within the organization like could you speak to that sure so for permitting specifically I have a permitting team of, well, three people and then a director. And that's it. The permit, I mean, I told you we have 700 that we're currently doing right now. The, what we have done that we found works the best is we actually divide it by ward or wards. So one person has five different wards and they are responsible for processing those. So what happens when an event, so when you for, submit for an event, it comes through us and it gets pushed out for a review. Um, and then my team is responsible for court, working with the organizer and the city departments. And it's very, like, we keep, we keep making updates to the permit portal. It is a continuous process, but it's, you know, it's like, you know, okay, we need a safety plan. There's comments. Okay, okay, organizer, you need to do this. Okay, CFD, they did it. I mean, it's, you know, we, we continue to try to find ways to do that. But that's what, as far as organizing it by my team, and they are usually, I mean, we usually have 30 to 40 events a weekend that they're processing. I have a suggestion for you. Yeah, you mentioned absolutely. the. Uh, I need to take somebody taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the problem about communicating with aldermen. Yes. Uh, DWM has solved it by like giving them iPads with What's RPM DWM? reports. What's DWM? Department of Water Management. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so DWM solved it by giving out iPads to aldermen. So like 50 aldermen, 50 iPads, and like Power BI reports hosted within the uh, DWM facility, not on the cloud, not paying Microsoft $5,000 a month. Uh, so yeah. So there is a way, so aldermen have access to the permit portal and you can download by their ward and we actually did do a training. Great. I don't know. We, we did. <laughs> I don't know how many people participated, you know, but it's still, and, and what we found is um, 
One of the things we've really focused on is aldermanic awareness and community engagement over the course of the last year. And our team goes out into the wards to do it. And we also like do one-on-ones and it just, it does take a lot of handhold. It, it's confusing. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. It is a very confusing process. So we continue to work with them, you know, and a lot of times it's not the alderman, it's their chief of staff or someone designated. And that person might not be the same um, as long. So you're training somebody new, but there is a way for them to download it. It's just also one of many different things that they're doing as well, so. I just want to thank you for your time. I know you don't have to do this, but you're doing this, so I really appreciate it. No, this is great, and like I said, I'm looking for uh, ways to make things more efficient would be wonderful. So there's a a question about um, uh, how events change based on larger policy priorities, and the example was the decision to break up uh, the taste from being just downtown to do align with city goals about equity. It's a great question, actually, because our taste in the neighborhoods is continuing to become more and more popular. So for for those that don't know, I mean, Taste of Chicago downtown is obviously a marquee event that has happened for a really long time. Um, But actually, I believe it kind of stemmed from uh, COVID, um, really kind of going out into the neighborhoods. So we now have Taste of Chicago pop ups. And there are three of them that we've had in different neighborhoods for the past couple years. They are a huge success. Um, And it's really great because it's smaller, and not only do we have the ability to get um, different, um, like, food vendors in that may not be able to actually do Taste of Chicago, you can get food vendors, like, from those communities in. Um, It's a great way to stimulate the communities, and that's kind of why it started, you know, how I was mentioning post-COVID, we were really trying to get people in the neighborhood, stimulate the communities, get businesses back again, and that's kind of where that came out of. And I'm not sure if I'm actually answering the question fully. What else was the question? I'm uh, sorry. I just guess like how, um, how or if, I guess, like policy priorities dictate changes in events, I guess. I mean, for that, you know, it, it was po- policy and procedures was because of COVID. We really we needed to find a different way to do things. Um, and because um uh, Taste of Chicago moved to September, um, so we also used it as an opportunity to do something kind of leading up and promoting Taste of Chicago so that we still had things during the summer. Um, and it actually has turned into a really great experience and to provide opportunities for more vendors and very popular as well. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about your perspective in terms of like, your counterparts who have similar roles perhaps in other cities and what kind of What are the maybe unique advantages or challenges in terms of the way Chicago's various cultural organizations interface and are structured that you've seen in your role maybe compared to other cities? Well, we did a couple years ago, and unfortunately I wasn't very involved in the process, but we actually did a comparison with other other cities as far as the amount of money that was allocated for grants. And this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'll kind of bring it back um, because it talked about I mean, when you're talking about arts and culture, you know, the Department of Cultural Affairs and special events. I mean, my role is talking about producing events and facilitating events. But what Dep- Department of Culture, like culture and arts is really supporting the arts and culture. And especially once again, during COVID, it was how do we support that? And we found that Chicago was not high on the bar at all. I mean, and so um, in doing and evaluating that, we actually were able to get an influx of money and really start to give out money more to arts and cultural organizations to really allow them to do events too, because we can only do so much. You know, we can host our events and things like that, but we also need to be realistic that it's just as important to help give money out to cultural organizations to help stimulate them to actually do events as well. So that's kind of a roundabout way to answer it, but that's kind of been my most recent experience in working with other city cultural organizations. Thank you. Um, my question is, and you can keep this as, um, like, diplomatic <laughs> Use anonymous. You know. <laughs> anonymous on live stream? <laughs> yeah, it's anonymous as possible. But what, like, what is like the weirdest thing that has happened? <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, I didn't see this coming from anywhere. <laughs> and you can be honest with you want. The weirdest thing. Um, well, weird or just like 
I never would have thought, you know, like, I, I how did they manage to do that? <laughs> <laughs> the one thing you talk about over dinner with her. Um, I can tell, I, I, this is, so um, I was, I worked on the Great Chicago Fire Festival. <laughs> <laughs> And I absolutely love the people who produce that event. I am not saying anything bad against them. They are wonderful producers. Um, but if you know the Great Chicago Fire Festival, um, the fire never happened. So that was definitely um, a unique situation to be put in when you had thousands of people along the Chicago River and you had these you know, platform structures waiting to burn and they never burned. Um, and it was like, what do we do now? <laughs> there are fireworks. <laughs> Go to fireworks. On to the next act. <laughs> that one people did notice didn't happen. Sorry, I guess I should. No, but I mean, and I, like you know, it, it was um, that was. It wasn't a learning experience. It was definitely you know a unique situation. Um, but I will say that I have nothing, like, nothing bad to say against any of those organizers. It was really, I think, the number of people that actually came down to that event shows what a great concept it was. And they didn't plan for it to rain nonstop for like two weeks straight. So that's something that never could have been planned for. And I would love for them to have an opportunity to kind of showcase that again. Um, that's a two part question. From, we want to produce a new event on the beach. Are you involved with that at all as far as permitting and if we needed to get like a small band or something? And then walk us through any secrets or things that are happening for the DNC that <laughs> we're not going to, you know, like, like how bad is it going to be or how <laughs> do we really all need to just plan our vacation? So I'll start with the beach. Um, <laughs> so this is another one of those wonderful city things, and I didn't get to talk about it too much. But So if you're looking to do something on the beach, that's actually Chicago Park District. And here's the fun thing. You have to do a Chicago Park District permit, okay? So get that done, and then come see me. Because if you're doing, if you're doing something on the beach, have at it. If you are selling food, serving alcohol, anything like that, then you also have to do a permit with me. So you have two permits that you have to do. Now, I will, like, over the course of the last um, year, we've tried to work a lot closer with the park district. They actually now have access to our permit portal to be able to see, but we still have two permit applications. Um, and that's, it's, I don't foresee how we can break that because you also have to do a permit for a picnic. Like there's, you know, so yeah, so if anybody else has ideas, always open. But as of right now, um, that's what it is. What um, um, so, I mean, finding out if something is available is usually pretty quick. Um, it, it depends on how complete your application is will be my standard line for that one. <laughs> Submit a complete application and we're happy to process it quickly. Um, but no, I mean, it, you know, it shouldn't, depending on what it is, it shouldn't take too long. Um, but yeah. um, as, so for the DNC, anything in specific, you're, you know, well, I'm kind of know, ancillary, so I'm not. Is it just at the United Center? Is it citywide? Really, McCormick, McCormick Place. place? Is there gonna be uh, there's, you know, <laughs> there's, there's going to be a lot of different areas affected. I mean, obviously, the United Center and McCormick Place are going to be the main areas, and um I don't believe they've released the exact kind of perimeters around there, um, but they're going to be affected. Um, but then there's locations where those high-level people are going to be at. The routes that they take to get there are going to impact traffic. Um, and some of those routes will be announced in advance, and some of them won't um, for you know a variety of different reasons, sometimes because they don't know until the day before, so um, and sometimes because they can't know until the day before. Um, so is it going to be congested? I'm, yes, but um, there'll definitely be ways to navigate through the city, too. So, and I think if you get that OEMC app, you'll know where to go. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I want to know what methods of collaboration decision-making you have because you have 15 or so departments and sister agencies. For example, does every event have an executive? Is there an attempt to find consensus? Does one department's considerations typically outweigh other departments? Or is there something else? Um, okay, so 
For major large scale events, there are, I believe it's nine, eight or nine major departments. And I'm going to consider the ones that are kind of part of the permitting process. You know, so going back to my, oh, look, it's still up. How convenient. Um, you know, the, it's CPD, CFD, OEMC. Oh, it's way too far back here. Um, it's um, CDOT is one of the big ones. Um, I said CFD. There's, like I said, I think there's a, oh, Chicago Transit Authority um, and then our office as well. Um, so, and there are, there are people, there are main people who are responsible for reviewing and kind of being the main person to approve it. Um, their responsibilities, you know, they vary depending on the department. But like, you know, for example, CDOT has to look at how it impacts um, what potential construction is happening. The Chicago Fire Department is going to look at your EMS plan. Um, the um, OEMC and um, is going to look at your uh, evacuation plan. You know, so each of them are evaluating different aspects of it. And once they become comfortable, so there is kind of a chief for each department. Um, as far as who outweighs what, CPD and CFD are the main people. They are the ones who can deny an event, um, both for lack of um, safety and also for resources. You know, um, we have really tried to become conscious of um, the resources needed to support all of these events and the resources needed every single day for CPD and CFD to be on the streets. Um, so when a new event especially comes in, that district actually reviews it and they are able to determine whether or not they have the resources to support it as well. Did that answer it well enough? And I'm going to stick around too if anyone has questions. So. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks.